Very good. It appears, Council, you are both in the courtroom. So, uh, Council for the Appellant, Mr. Kupal, if you're ready to proceed, we're ready to hear you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Jason Scott Kupal uh, from the law firm of Iowa and Eichen, and I represent the appellant in this case, Scott Singer. Your Honor, we've assigned three points of error uh, in our brief, and I'd like to follow that um, path uh, in my argument. Uh, the first point is whether the trial court erred in holding uh, Mr. Singer in contempt uh, after for non-payment of child support, when it is undisputed that at the time of the hearing, which was held uh, in uh, July of 2018, that he had paid all of the amounts that were due uh, several months before, and in fact was ahead on his payments. We submit that the uh, answer to this question is that the trial court did, in fact, err. Uh, Your Honor, um, referring to the Florida Supreme Court's uh, case in Bowen versus Bowen, the purpose of uh, civil contempt uh, is to uh, address the violation of a court order uh, that is current. In other words, that when uh, it is presumed that when the court considers whether or not the party is in contempt, that there must be a current violation that, that is there. Uh, in the present matter, um, I'd like to give a little bit of the timeline in this case, and I think that that might be uh, a little bit of, uh, uh, provide a, a, a sufficient background for this. Uh, Your Honor, the let, final- let me, let me ask one question before you go into that. In the, uh, I think it's the ba Bajkar, I'm not sure how you pronounce that case, that both parties discussed in the briefs, the third DCA recognized that typically contempt is to uh, not punish past conduct, but to coerce future conduct. Is there any case that outright says you cannot do what the trial court did in this case? Uh, Your Honor, if I may respond, the, the, in my research, I did not discover a case more specific than Bajkar. Uh, I believe that uh, Bajkar and its uh, citation to Bowen are the most uh, uh, specific uh, pronouncements on this issue. So um, I, can, can Bajkar's statement be interpreted to be that, okay, the court was satisfied your client didn't pay for a period of months and had the obligation to do so, and the court had information as far as the insurance situation. Could the court have held him in contempt? And in this case, there's no purge amount because the amount was paid, but basically saying you've been a, you have not complied with your obligations in the past, and I'm gonna make sure that you comply with the futures. I'm holding you in contempt, but you don't have any sanction related to the, uh, the child support. Is that, is there anything that says the court can't do that? Uh, Your Honor, if uh, there is no case that I found that says the court cannot do that, I can only refer the court back to Bowen and Bajkar. And I can also say that as a matter of, of, of practical reality, um, generally uh, courts do not go forward when a, uh, a act deemed to be contemptuous has been resolved. I think that the entire point of, of seeking the relief is that when uh, there is no longer a need for the court to adjudicate it, um, that it should not continue forward. Was there um, an objection at the start of the hearing to say, judge, you can't do this? Well, Your Honor, first of all, we were a little bit unclear as to exactly what was going on because of the nature of, uh, because of the hearing, first of all, would have gone on because there were two uh, acts of contempt that were alleged. Um, but we did point out to the court that repeatedly that the uh, amounts due had been satisfied before uh, the hearing and that there was nothing left uh, to be determined at that point. So was, I guess my question is, did you argue to the court, judge, you either don't have jurisdiction or you don't have authority to consider one of the two issues that's being argued today? Uh, Your Honor, I, I do not believe there was a specific argument made to that point. Um, again, we were unsure as to what, you know, how the, what the uh, appellee was going to proceed until she actually did. Uh, and I believed, Your Honor, that the fact that the, the law, in, at least in my estimation, was clear enough that the court could not move forward on that issue um, would have mitigated against making a separate argument to that effect. My, well, but there was a fair amount of time at the hearing spent on that issue, correct? Yes, there was, Your Honor. And it seems to me the first time, from my reading of the record, the first time anyone argued the issue of whether the court actually could consider contempt was in the motion for rehearing. Um, Your Honor, I, I believe that I would, again, I, I would submit that the uh, 
that the issue of whether or not uh, it was appropriate, I think, was was raised, of, I mean, via argument. I don't think it was as much that there was a specific jurisdictional argument made. However, I guess there, there was repeated reference to the fact that the court um, had nothing to rule on at that time. Well, uh, can I ask a question also? When, when, I don't want to interrupt you, Judge. No, go ahead. Uh, so here's my question. You pay the amounts before the actual hearing, but after the petition is filed, and then you don't set a motion to dismiss the contempt proceedings, but yet you go to the contempt proceedings and you defend saying, oh, we paid. Why wasn't this set for hearing ahead of time to resolve it? It seems to me that would have been the proper way to handle it as opposed to putting yourself raising it as a defense. Your arguments could have been presented in a motion to dismiss and that wasn't done. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct, Your Honor. Um, the reason that the, and I will only point out, at least from my perspective, I was not trial counsel until before. No, I, obviously, you, you've considered both sides of the coin here, and you're doing a fine job. But from where I'm sitting, having been a trial judge, I don't know how many times petitioners would file a motion for contempt, then it'd be compliance, but they never actually set their motion for hearing. Here, you've got three three months or so of unpaid obligations and then that's going to beg the question of well who pays for the attorney fees that ha that had to be go into the petition to hold this person in contempt who pays for all that extra work because you're talking about 108 dollar a week child support payment correct 108 dollars and 57 cents a month your honor so, uh, yeah a month that's i mean that's crazy to right. go through all this for for that right and it just well, seems to me that the judge had to stop this from happening in the future and that's where the abuse of discretion comes in so if it's a jurisdiction argument that's fine but if there's no case on point it seems to me it's an abuse of discretion argument your honor i i, I appreciate that that position I, I will point out regarding the amount of the child support there was testimony uh, at the conclusion of the hearing that um the amount had not been decided uh, in this case until the final judgment was entered Although the court did award child support to uh, the appellate, the appellee, the amount was left to be determined um, by the council exchanging child support uh, calculations. And so until the uh, final judgment in April 9th was entered, there was no specific amount. Uh, yes. The court okay, what was that amount determined? Okay. The amount was determined in the final, in the written final judgment, which was on April 9th of okay, 2018. And that was rendered before the deficiency occurred. That well, the the deficiency alleged was that um, Mr. Uh, Singer had failed to pay child support for February, March, April, and and May at that point. So However, it again, overlapping. it was it was there was an overlap, and what apparently had happened, Your Honor, and I believe that's reflected in the record, is there was a great deal of back and forth uh, between the parties as to the proper form of the final judgment, um, and ultimately that it took some time. I believe. Then we argued to the court that Judge Williams, uh, the original trial judge, um, would um, had intended the, the parties to just calculate themselves, but probably also assumed that that calculation would have been complete fairly soon thereafter, and it would not have been three months. Well, let me ask then, Judge Williams directed that the payments begin February 1st, correct? That is correct. And there's argument uh, presented to the trial court in this contempt proceeding that the final judgment was being, the language of the final judgment was being debated back and forth, but that the amount of child support had been resolved very early on. That was not part of the continuing debate back and forth, correct? Uh, uh, Your Honor, I would turn to page 58 of the uh, transcript of the hearing in which uh, the court asked uh, counsel for the appellee whether or not the Judge Williams had set forth a specific amount. And um, the- no, Well, I think everybody agrees that, that Judge Williams did not set forth a specific amount, but counsel, trial counsel had apparently gone back and forth by emails and had, at least according to what I've read in the record, they had resolved the amount, but there were other parts of the final judgment that were still being debated. Am I reading that correctly or am I misconstruing it? I, I'm not sure that that, I, that that is entirely accurate, Your Honor. Again, um, a, um, I was not the counsel at the time, and B, um, I did read the correspondence, and it seems that there were many issues that were going back and forth. I don't think I'm child not- support, Was child support going back and forth? 
I, I believe that, Your Honor, that it was because of the fact that the parties were exchanging um, child support calculations. It was not, I do not believe it was decided early on. And did your client seek any clarification from Judge Williams as to the impossibility of payments being uh, beginning February 1? Uh, no, Your Honor, that was not and the case. And at that time, when she said payments have to begin February 1, your client was already behind on temporary child support. Is that correct? Uh, Your Honor, that was alleged. I do not uh, believe, having reviewed the record, that that is the case. However, that was, in fact, alleged. Wasn't there a determination of amounts past due and owing in the final judgment? Uh, I do not believe that that was the case, uh, Your Honor. I believe that it was prospective. The court, I believe, specifically uh, declined to award retroactive child support and alimony. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, is our position, again, the budge car and the Bowen decisions uh, compel a finding that, that contempt is not an available remedy in this case? Uh, certainly, as, uh, as a, a matter of, of practical reality, the court certainly can come up with um, remedies if they are properly sought. In this case, they were not. Um, there was no reason to find uh, Mr. Singer in contempt. Um, because of the fact that he had already resolved these at the time of the hearing. Uh, Your Honor, I, I would like to uh, move to uh, the second point, which is the issue uh, regarding the insurance. Um, in the final judgment, uh, in both the oral pronouncement in January of 2018 and the final judgment, which was entered on April 9th, there was a requirement that Mr. Singer uh, maintain uh, comparable insurance to what he had uh, for health, vision, and dental. Um, there was testimony uh, at the final hearing uh, that was unrebutted that Mr. Singer uh, had a policy on the, uh, uh, the uh, exchange for the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, and that every year the policy was reevaluated to determine um, whether or not he qualified for that. Um, the testimony was that as of, Janu of January of 2018, he was informed by his broker that because of income issues, he was no longer eligible for the policy. Uh, he was given the choice of other policies that he had available, and he chose the best one that he could find. Um, now, there let me ask you a question on that, because the language in the final judgment was to continue providing the policy that was in effect at the time of trial or something comparable. Your client testified that he was offered three, I think it was three alternative policies and the broker said this was the best one. Was there any effort to determine whether or not that policy was comparable to the Blue Cross Blue Shield gold policy? Uh, Your Honor, I don't think there was any specific effort to do that. I think that what Mr. Singer testified to at the hearing was that he took what he believed was as close as possible to what he could get. He but indicated... he did not check with any other brokers, any other insurance agents to see if there were other policies available that would have been comparable to the Blue Cross Blue Shield Gold policy? Uh, my understanding is that he did not, Your Honor. Okay. Um, again, the, testif the testimony uh, at, the front, at the hearing indicated that Mr. Singer had tried um, to obtain the gold plan and it was not available. Specifically, uh, the uh, appellee was asked, um, did she know whether or not uh, Mr. Singer qualified uh, for the gold plan? And she replied, I don't know that. She was also asked, um, um, did, um, did she know whether the gold plan was available to uh, Mr. Singer? And the answer again was she did not know. Again, Mr. T Mr. Singer's testimony was essentially unrebutted in that he tried and could not do that. While I'm cer certainly, Your Honor, there, uh, there could be questions as to how he went about that. The fact is that the court had to find that he had willfully failed to, find, to provide uh, the same or comparable uh, coverage. Um, and in this case, Your Honor, the unrebutted testimony is that there was not a willful failure or refusal to do so. It was simply a matter of uh, the fact that he was not made, this was not made available to him uh, on the exchange. Uh, and he also testified that this happened every year, that it was, it was constantly reviewed that's every year. The, that's part of the problem, isn't it? That he said it wasn't available on the exchange, but he didn't look to any other companies, any other possible policies to determine if there was something comparable to what was contained in the final judgment, what was identified in the final judgment as the Blue Cross Blue Shield gold policy. I mean, there was nothing in the final judgment that required him to stay with Blue Cross Blue Shield, right? 
That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. And my understanding is your uh, uh, question. You're at 15 minutes. You didn't ask to reserve any. Do you wish to reserve any time? I, I do, Your Honor. If I could reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Very good. Uh, Your Honor, my understanding uh, is that uh, when a party goes to an insurance broker seeking a policies on the exchange, that the policies that are offered uh, through the exchange are similar broker to broker. So it's not necessarily, I believe, an issue that Mr. Singer could have gone from uh, to another broker to find additional insurance. Essentially, what is available on the exchange is, a, are, is available on the exchange. Uh, I don't uh, believe that, that that would have necessarily changed it. However, again, we submit that um, there was no uh, testimony whatsoever that Mr. Singer had uh, had willfully failed or refused to provide the policy. And in fact, um, the only testimony that was there was that he had tried to do that. I, I, obviously, Your Honor, uh, the third point is on uh, attorney's fees, and there are two issues with that. Obviously, we have argued in points one and two that uh, contempt was not an available uh, remedy in this case. Um, the uh, order entered by the court suggests that it is a compensatory uh, award um, based upon the contempt. Um, it is our position that um, the contempt being improper, that there was no basis for attorney's fees under that. The court also as an alternate uh, me uh, measure indicated that it could award attorney's fees based upon the, um, the present circumstances of the parties, but did not elaborate. Uh, Your Honor, we've cited to a number of cases, including the Perez case, in which the court specifically holds that if a, par if a court is going to make um, a award based upon the financial circumstances of the party, and we assume in this case that the court was considering a Florida statute 61.16, um, that uh, the court must make specific findings of both uh, the, uh, the applying party's need for the fees and the opposing party's uh, ability to pay. Uh, the court did not do that and simply determined that in its opinion, the fees were reasonable. Um, Your Honor, you know, there was no testimony uh, at the hearing at all as to uh, Mrs. Singer's need um, for uh, the uh, fees. There was some, the court did uh, mention in a single sentence that Mr. Singer had the ability to pay, uh, did not elaborate on that but did not in any way find that um, Mrs. Singer had a need uh, for the fees. Um, there's also been some suggestion that the record uh, has information to that effect. The final judgment that had been entered in April um, found that actually Miss uh, Singer had made more than Mr. Singer. And so we believe that there was no basis for the court to conclude that uh, Miss Singer was in need either from the lack of its findings in the order or from the state of the record at that time. Uh, Your Honor, I believe that my time is uh, running short. Uh, You've got your two minutes for rebuttal, so if you want to wrap up, we're, we'll move on. Yes, Your Honor. We believe that for the points uh, laid forward in our brief and discussed today, that the court erred in uh, finding um, Mr. Singer in contempt on as to both the payment of uh, child support and to the uh, failure to provide uh, insurance. And we believe also that the attorney's fee awards following them are also defective and therefore all must be reversed. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, counsel. Mr. Sims. His mic is muted. Yeah, it automatically did that. Good morning, your honors. Good morning. How are you today? Uh, to answer one of your questions uh, you posed to counsel, uh, Judge Silverman, um, yes, there were iterations of the final judgment going around. In fact, uh, exhibit uh, two at the hearing was uh, one of the very first iterations of that final judgment that contained the actual amount of child support that had been calculated between trial counsel and myself at the amount of $108 and change, which was in the ultimately in the final judgment. So that amount was resolved very early on. We didn't have dispute over what the child support guideline number was. We were pretty clear as to what the findings of the court were to be able to plug those numbers into the child support guidelines and come up with that number. And Mr. Uh, Singer, uh, the appellant in this case, actually testified that he reviewed those drafts of the final judgment. So he was very, very well aware that that $108 and change per month number had not changed in any of the iterations or drafts since February. Um, also to answer another question, he was delinquent in the payment of child support leading up to the final hearing. And as exhibit B to the actual final judgment, 
uh, there was a list of monies owed from temporary orders by husband and wife. And what was owed by the former husband ultimately was from the months of March 2017 through October of 17, $8,972.80. And then from October of 17 through January of 18 um, was $927.28. So he had, he was substantially delinquent. A lot of that was set off against some other credits that he was entitled to. But in fact, he had made no payments of temporary child support or uh, ultimately uh, ongoing child support since March of 2017, which was nearly a year before the rendering of the final judgment by the trial court in this case. Um, we all know what the steps are to find someone in contempt. Is a proper notice uh, and mo of the motion in the hearing? Do we establish uh, the prior order? The movement has to establish the prior order, then has to establish non-compliance. Then the burden shifts to the respondent to show an inability to perform or an excuse. And then if the court grants the motion, it can interpose appropriate sanctions, including incarceration, fees, suit money and costs, compensatory or coercive fines, and any other coercive sanction permitted by law. If the court orders incarceration or a coercive fine, then obviously there has to be a purge uh, amount set forth in the order because um, otherwise you don't have the keys to the jail as you're required to. And it's set forth specifically in Florida uh, Family Law Rule of Prestige of 12.615 and in Bowen. And that's exactly what we did in this case. There was no dispute over notice. Uh, the record reveals that the prior order, which was the final judgment of April of 2018, required the former husband to pay child support in the amount of $108.79 per month, commencing on February 1st, 18, and on the first day of each month thereafter. The record also demonstrates that the husband, at the time, reviewed drafts of the proposed final judgment before entry and was therefore aware of the monthly child support for the guidelines. As far back as February of 2018, he was present in January of 2018, when Judge Williams made her oral pronouncements and told him, look, you've got a child support obligation that's going to commence on February 1st, 2018. Um, the record also demonstrates that even after entry of the final judgment in April of 2018, he failed to make any payments until mid-May of 2018. He made no child support payment at all during uh, February. Well, so maybe you can focus on his comment that they cured the deficiency prior to the hearing, but after the petition was filed. Right, he did. And to allow, um, I think the argument that, look, if someone files a motion for contempt and then I pay the amount that's due, the contempt goes away and we don't have a hearing, um, I think that leads to kind of an absurd conclusion uh, to the point that you made, Judge Volante, which is at this point, the, uh, the wife had incurred attorney's fees for filing that motion. And this is something that could be repeated ad infinitum in a case like this, not pay the child support, force the other side to file a motion, then prior to the hearing, pay the, the amounts that are owed, thereby depriving the court of uh, the opportunity. But you don't believe there's any jurisdictional impediments? I'm sorry? You don't believe there's any jurisdictional impediments? I do not, I do not. And the court, uh, ultimately found that, uh, did not find, look, there's an arrearage amount and you're in contempt for not paying this amount of money. The court found him in contempt for the failure to not make child support payments when he had been ordered to make the payments and the failure to timely make those child support payments on the first day of each month as required by the order. And bear in mind, he received this final judgment April 9th of 2018. Uh, the record reflects that in an attempt to mitigate this, I sent over a letter a couple of weeks later to trial counsel and I said, hey, where's the child support? We don't have any, let's get that cleared up. I got a letter back on May 1st saying, oh, he'll pay it. No idea as to when. I waited an additional uh, week or so, sent him another letter and I said, look, you know, we still don't, even, now we're past due in May. Still no reply. So." Three days after I sent that letter, I went ahead and I filed the original motion for contempt. This and it's probably a self-healing problem. In you. I'm sorry? Judge Lanty, your, mic your microphone is on mute. 
You may have hit your space bar. Probably did. Okay, yep. sorry, technology. It's probably a self-healing problem in your situation because the child's about to turn 18 or just turned 18. No, he's not that old yet. How old is the child? Uh, 14 at the time of the hearing? Maybe 16? Yeah, he's like he's a teenager, but he's not quite 18 yet. Okay, I'm just saying it's not going to be a long-lived problem. No. If we had a three-year-old, they just get divorced. I'm the trial judge. I had to deal with this nightmare for another 15 years. Right. I don't want these people playing games. So right. really, the judge's concern is not overly well-founded, but still, it is a concern. Right, particularly when you look at the scope and nature of the litigation, there had been multiple motions uh, in this case directed to uh, what we believed was the husband's noncompliance with orders throughout the course of the case. All right, that's another, another reason to support the judge's decision, but what right. about the health insurance, the dental insurance? What's the deal with that? Well, the deal with that is um, on the issue of the insurance, the former husband was required to provide uh, health insurance that had been previously in effect to continue the health insurance and dental insurance that was in effect at the time of the trial um, and or, or other comparable insurance. That I think is a critical issue and distinction here. I think the former husband is really focusing on well, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Gold Plan wasn't available to me. Well, he wasn't ordered to provide the Blue Cross Blue Shield Gold Plan. He was ordered- Was there, to any, was there any proof that there was comparable insurance available to the Gold Plan? I'm sorry? Was there any proof that there was in fact comparable insurance available to him to the Gold Plan? Judge, I think that puts the, the, the former wife in the position of having to kind of prove the negative. In but once he testifies, it's not available. My employer says I don't qualify. What does he do after that? Does he bring in 12 different insurance witnesses to say we have nothing? Well, he didn't have an employer uh, at the time. Uh, well, he did have an employer at the time. He had been self-employed for many, many years as a mortgage broker. And he did not have this insurance through his employment. This was a self-pay plan that he had outside of any employment that he might have had. Um, in this situation... Uh, we have to look to what did he actually do. Uh, the record reveals that the totality of efforts he made to comply with the court order was that he spoke to this one insurance broker and requested the best plan, whatever that means. Um, the record demonstrates that he didn't conduct any other search. Um, it also demonstrates, as Judge Silver Silverman indicated, that he only asked for plans that were available through the Affordable Health Care Act, which he had not qualified for previously, but he did qualify based on his income, he says, for this particular year. He did not ask this insurance agent for, you know, whether he could keep the gold plan. He specifically, I asked a question, he didn't, he didn't ask for that. He didn't say, well, despite the three options you gave me, can I purchase this plan? He just went with the three options available under the Affordable Health Care Plan. He didn't ask for comparable coverage to what he previously had. He didn't advise the agent that he was required to provide comparable coverage or provide that gold plan. He didn't advise the agent, he said it was based on his income, that he could not qualify for the gold plan, but he didn't advise the agent that the final judgment had imputed him at $50,000 annually, so that that would be the number that they should use. He didn't show the, the uh, agent a copy of the final judgment. Um, he didn't call Blue Cross Blue Shield directly to purchase the gold plan. His only efforts were to contact this one broker. And simply the burden of proof is on him to show uh, avoidance of uh, why he should not be held in contempt or an avoidance of why he should not have to comply with what the court's order was, either inability or excuse. He did not carry his burden of proof on that because uh, in his testimony to the court, he kind of danced around it. Um, he kept saying, well, I got the best coverage that the agent offered me. Um, but there was no dispute that the insurance plan that he went with was substantially inferior to the plan that was in effect at the trial. And not only that, um, at the time of the trial, he was paying approximately $1,000 a month for coverage for himself and the child, which was calculated into the child support guideline worksheets. However, when he applied for this plan, his testimony was, he was paying $1,000 annually for this plan. So he sat back, 
got the benefit of a lower child support amount by claiming the amount that he paid for the gold plan and then went, reduced the benefits, reduced the coverage, made no real effort to keep the gold plan or other comparable insurance and got the benefit of lower child support as well. And I think that that's something that's uh, very important for the court to look at. Mr. Sims, was there some evidence in the record, if I'm recalling correctly, that this uh, change in plans happened almost immediately after the final judgment was entered? It was actually done um, immediately after the trial. The trial was in November and the court's oral pronouncements were made in January. And he applied in December for 2018's insurance coverage. And while we sat there, and so the new plan became effective January 1, he knew that. And we were sitting there in the courtroom with Judge Williams and he didn't advise Judge Williams, hey, my health insurance costs have changed. He heard the oral pronouncements that they were gonna use what he testified to at trial. And he, made, he didn't stand up and say, well, look, you know, in fairness, this, this isn't uh, the right number anymore. I have a different plan. He didn't do any of that. And we didn't even know about it until May when the former wife went to um, take the child to the doctor and then found out that the, the plan that she had, the card that she had from the prior plan didn't work anymore. And that's when she was made aware that he had changed the coverage from the gold plan to this lesser bronze plan. As to the issue of the attorney's fees, I think the court properly uh, found Mr. Singer to be in contempt of court. And the court is certainly free to award as a sanction uh, attorney's fees and costs, which is what the court did. Um, inartfully in the final judgment, it's referred to as a coercive civil sanction, not a fine, but a sanction, which I think it can be to coerce future compliance with the court's order. Uh, but assuming that uh, instead it should have been done as a compensatory civil sanction, I think the record supports that as well, because clearly the amount awarded was to compensate the former wife for the amount of fees and costs expended. And I did cite to the old tipsy coachman doctrine, which says, you know, essentially, you know, the court can make the uh, right decision for the wrong reason. Um, regarding the issue of the 6116 fees, um, the court, uh, I submit that the, we did not really get into uh, uh, the finances of the party so much. Uh, there was never really any argument by Mr. Singer that uh, I can't afford to pay for the gold plan or I couldn't afford to pay the child support or I forgot to pay either one of them. He just flat out did what he wanted to do. Um, but uh, the court did take into evidence and did review the final judgment of dissolution of marriage, which contained findings regarding each party's imputed incomes, which were within $500 a month of one another. The former wife was imputed at a higher amount, which has now been reversed uh, by the mandate that came down from the second DCA yesterday. I think Judge LaRose was on that panel. Um, but, and the former husband also had a parcel of real estate with approximately, I wanna say 60 to $70,000 more equity um, than was the real estate that the, uh, the wife was awarded. So I think there's sufficient basis there for an award under 6116 as well. And I would also indicate that uh, this court, uh, based on that same record, uh, awarded the uh, former wife 100% of her appellate attorney's fees uh, at the prior appeal regarding the final judgment where the mandate came down yesterday. And if there's no more questions, uh, I, I would rely on my brief at this point. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Zoltz. Very good. Uh, Mr. Kupel, we're ready for you to come back in. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. First of all, I would like to correct a, uh, a, a misapprehension or misstatement by my colleague. Um, he testified, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the a former wife testified that she was aware there was an issue with the insurance that Mr. Singer had told her this before the uh, oral pronouncement of the trial court in January. So the statement that she didn't find out about this until June when she went to take the child uh, for treatment uh, is not accurate based upon the testimony on the record. Uh, the second issue, Your Honor. It, Counsel, when did she find out? When, what's your position when she found out? The position is that Mr. Singer, and she, I believe she testified to this, Mr. Singer made her aware that there was an issue with getting the gold plan in January of 2018 before the court made its oral pronouncement uh, 
that was later reduced to the final judgment. So we believe that the idea that she was not aware of this um, is uh, is incorrect. Additionally, the testimony that the issue of insurance was perhaps in play as far as what he could get, but her testimony was she did not know that he had changed to this uh, bronze policy. And I think, in fact, your client testified that he gave the new insurance card to the child and said, give it to, basically give it to mom. Right. Uh, however, I would also point out that there is also testimony in the record, uh, Your Honor, that Miss Singer, uh, before this all arose, had gone to apply for Medicaid um, long before the motion for contempt was filed. Obviously, the only purpose she would have had for filing Medicaid is if the child did not have comparable coverage somewhere else, uh, or in fact, uh, Medicaid offered better coverage. So clearly, I don't think that the idea that this was something hidden from her uh, is, or the intimation thereof is accurate. Uh, second of all, Your Honor, I, I would point out that uh, regarding the argument is the tipsy coachman. Your Honor, um, clearly uh, the, the court relied on, on two grounds to award fees. Uh, one was the contempt itself, which we submit um, should, should not have been adjudicated as such. And number two was based upon the circumstances of the parties. Um, I don't really, I can't really tell exactly what the right, the, uh, the right reason for entering uh, that uh, fee award would have been. However, I think it's, it's clear, uh, based upon counsel's representations, I believe it's clear that there were no findings by the court regarding the uh, need or ability to pay. Uh, Mr. The, Google, that brings us to the end of your time. So thank, thank you, you counsel, both. Uh, we appreciate the arguments. And you will be taken out of the courtroom, and the next case will be Lambden versus Lambden. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you.